next speaker is uh, Leon Conrad. He's going to teach us something about Spencer Brown. Thank you. Uh, I would like to dedicate this talk to Spencer Brown, who's in his 94th year and has been instrumental on my own thinking in terms of not just logic, and I'm talking about classical logic here, uh, classical logic that has been called perennial logic by Sister Miriam Joseph, who wrote a book called The Trivium, uh, which I'm basing my thoughts on logic upon. Laws of form, laws of logic. I presume most of you are familiar with Spencer Brown's work. Anyone not familiar? Okay. Familiar is strong. And yeah, yeah. classical, <laughs> right. classical logic. <laughs> Anyone not familiar with the rules of classical logic? Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah, familiar is going on all night. All right. <laughs> Don't worry. They will be covered. I just wanted to know whether I could rush through them all. Uh, the outline of my talk is to give you a brief look at the ideas behind laws of form and laws of logic. Look at how Spencer Brown applied the calculus of indications in laws of form to working with classical syllogistic logic. What Louis Kaufman did in terms of taking Spencer Brown's work forward and how John Mingus built on that. The problems they came up with, and how I've reconciled Spencer Brown's use of symbolic logic to <coughs> classical logic. I'm going to demonstrate how using Spencer Brown's calculus can provide an efficiency in terms of the notation and validation of syllogistic logic, and can provide efficiency in terms of conversion, obversion, and eduction. We may not get to eduction. Because I want to spend the last t bit of my talk talking about a problem that still remains and get your points of view on this, because there are some unresolved questions in my mind. So I'd be very grateful for your ideas on this. But let's go to laws of form. Laws of form starts in the void from which there emerges, and in which there appears, a distinction, which Spencer Brown calls a dis the first distinction, which can be symbolized as a circle suspended in some kind of space. That allows an inside, an outside, and a border to be defined. And once that has happened, it allows acts of crossing those can take place either from the inside to the outside, or from the outside to the inside. If the act of crossing takes place from the inside to the outside, that is, in Spencer Brown's terms, like creating a rubber stamp, a token of that circle. If it takes place from the outside to the inside, then it's like taking a circle and putting it inside the first. And that, for him, is equivalent to the space in which the mark exists. At least that's how I understand the form. Those two basic acts of distinction and indication are central to the system. That's how he builds his whole thing. And a circle drawn on a sheet of paper creates a distinction. This allows one side of the distinction to be indicated or marked. It doesn't matter whether you mark the inside or the outside. Conventionally, it's more convenient to indicate the inside as marked. And the shorthand for that is that upside down reverse L, the mark. To indicate the outside, we have a mark over mark. Spencer Brown puts forward two sets of arithmetic initials and moves. So two marks side by side can condense into one mark, and one mark can come expand to two. 
mark over mark can just be rubbed out because it is equivalent to the blank piece of paper on which it's written. That's all I have to say about laws of form. As for the laws of logic, well, they're based on terms. Terms, as far as I'm concerned, are marks in the mind. Two terms joined to create simple propositions, and they come in four forms. Positive, negative, universal, particular. The A, I, E, O letters that we use for the shorthand forms to refer to these four forms come from two Latin words. The first vowels in the Latin words relate to the universal propositions. A is the first vowel in affirmo, I affirm, I assert, so that stands for all A is B. E is the first vowel in the word nego, I negate, that is the universal negative, which is no A is B. I becomes some A is B, O becomes some A is not B. Well, if you've got three terms, you can create a syllogism with one term, the middle term, shared between two propositions. So the most common one is all A and B, all B is C, therefore all A is C. And that's called a barbarous syllogism because you have three A-type propositions. The figure one relates to the position that the middle term is in. There are four um, possibilities here. And I'm consistently putting the minor premise first. Written out horizontally at the bottom right of the slide, the position of the middle term in the first figure is that they're close together in the middle. In the second figure, that they're both the predicate term of the propositions. In the third figure, they're both the subject terms. And in the fourth figure, they're on the outside. Spencer Brown's approach to symbolic logic is to use variables and marks to distinguish between the four types of syllogisms. So, in A, uh, sorry, four types of propositions. A propositions are notated as A with a mark over it, B. And he interprets that as all A is B and A implies B. I propositions, some A is B, are also interpreted as it is not the case that A implies not B. E propositions, A, mark, B, mark. And O propositions, it is not the case that A implies B. So, an A with a mark over it, all by itself, is equivalent to an A negated. If you have down at the bottom A with a mark over it and B next to it, you read it as A implied B. But it could also be not A or B. And this leads to problems. But we'll come to that later. First of all, if I go back, have a look at how he notates the and relationship. You've got A with a mark over it, B with a mark over it, and mark over 2. And that's going to be used to build a syllogism in the way he notates it. So a barber syllogism starts off with that all A is B and, this is where the and comes in, all B is C implies, and that's where you put an extra mark over them, that all A is C. Now remember the arithmetic initials. If you have mark over mark, you can eliminate those because those are equivalent to the blank piece of paper. Well, you've got that in that expression. So you can reduce the Barber syllogism to two propositions which have marks over them and a conclusion which doesn't. That, Spencer Brown argues, produces a prototype. And from this prototype, not only can we transpose each complex, that means we can move each um, bit of the expression around, we can also independently cross each literal variable. So you can put a cross over the A, you can put a cross over the B, you can put a cross over the C, and find by a combination of these means a set of 24 distinguishable valid 
arguments. He doesn't explain how to do that beyond that. He leaves it to the reader to find out. He says it's very simple. I didn't find it very simple. In fact, he continues, not all 24 are distinguished in logic, which can arrive somewhat arbitrarily at the number 15. So what he's saying is, if you play about with this uh, prototype, you get 24 valid uh, arguments, and they don't match the ones that we know in classical logic. Thanks to Louis Kaufman, who produced uh, Wheel of Syllogisms, we've worked out that yes, we can put in that prototype into 24 patterns and produce 24 valid arguments. Kaufman kept the notation the same for the A and the I propositions, but when it came to the E propositions, he converted those to an A proposition, reading them, all A is not B, rather than no A is B. And the O propositions remain the same. That lack of distinction between negation and implication will see leads to problems. It leads to problems for me as somebody who works with classical logic when I want to come to work with patterns that include E propositions. Just to remind you of these um, shapes that look the same, I want to know whether I'm negating or um, implying or distributing a term. The way Camastress is um, depicted in Louis Kaufman's paper is this. Now, you're supposed to have an A proposition and an E proposition as the premises, but I can't tell visually which is which. These are the ways that the four propositions are notated. And the way this goes reads, all C is not B. I'm starting with the middle proposition. Uh, that's the A proposition. Because in the forms, the three-letter forms of classical logic, the second proposition is taken first. So all C is not B. All A is not B. So all A is not C. That's fine, it's an AA1 proposition, but we've switched the state of the predicate term C. You've got all C is not B in the second proposition, and that becomes all A is not C in the conclusion. C has changed to not C. That's a problem. And you've got two middle terms, not B, and neither of them is distributed. In classical logic, that's a problem. But, we, we know how to derive the 24 um, valid arguments now. John Mingus took Louis Kaufman's work further and asked himself, can we apply this to classical logic? When attempting to validate syllogisms using the consequences which arise from the calculus indications via truth tables, he found out that 83 syllogisms known to be invalid appeared to be valid, being a problem. Now, what he found out was that if he changed the notation of the particular um, propositions, the I and the O forms, then that helped. If you look at the, the red highlighted things, you'll see that the values on the bottom row are equivalent to the values on the second row. Because an A with a mark over mark on top of it means that you can take off those two marks because they're equivalent to the blank sheet of paper and you just need to write the A variable. Similarly, at the end with a B with a single mark over it, you carry that single mark down, there you go. You have a very neat way of writing out a single line of variables and using a single letter of marks to notate the four types of propositions. He found that when he did that, the number of invalid syllogisms shown to be valid was reduced from 83 to 17. 
That's an improvement, but it was still a concern. This is the table he produced showing how the 15 valid syllogisms of classical logic were derived. He then found out that 15 of the 17 forms that were known to be invalid, but appeared to be valid, were actually mirror forms of these 15. So A changed to O, E changed to I. There were also two mavericks, AAO4 and OOA4 had no explanation for these. I would just want to look at how he derived a Calamus syllogism, because Calamus has the E proposition in it. In Louis Kaufmann's wheel, it's written out as an A proposition in Barbara. All not A are B, all B are not C, all not A are not C. And that's written out like this. Louis Kaufmann, going fast, doing shorthand, does not put in the mark over marks of the variables. I put them in just for clarity. He works out that they're valid. I've got no problems with that. The conclusion he arrives at is equivalent to all not A are not C. And he converts that to all C are A. I get no problem. Mingus, however, interprets that differently. I've here clarified between the mark of negation and the mark of implication. How do we get an AEE4 calamus syllogism from this? One of them has to be uh, negated. So it must be the second proposition because that's the only one that has the potential to put a mark of negation over the predicate term. This is how it would be written out normally, no A is B, all C is A, that's the fourth figure, you've got the middle term on the outside, no C is B. Mingus, however, says, keeps the middle term on the outside, that's fine. He negates the second proposition, no B is C, all A is B, there's a problem there, because the term should be no, not A is B. But in his conclusion, he's got no C is A, those terms are switched, and the A is not negated. So, his thing looks like that, doesn't match Kaufman's original, and I have a problem with that. However, if you mark it to match Kaufman's, you come up with a new syllogism, which is valid, inferior. So you've got the second proposition, the first proposition, you've got A with a mark of negation and a mark of distribution, or implication onto it. Those can be removed, you've got A, B, and that's equivalent to an I proposition. You've got marks over the B and C, that's an E proposition. You can remove the middle terms and derive a conclusion of some A is not C. And that works, but it's very well. So, Mingus found that there were 17 valid forms, 15 match uncontroversially valid forms of classical logic, but there are two mavericks, two outliers, and there are problems with his methodology. You can immediately tell that those mavericks don't work if you know the rules of classical logic. You can't have two positive propositions that lead to a negative conclusion, and you can't have two particular propositions that lead to a universal positive conclusion. The good news is we can reconcile Spencer Brown's work with laws of logic. If we keep the signs of negation and the signs of distribution, and I'm deliberately changing my reference to implication to distribution here, and I'll tell you why in a minute, we come out with 12 valid synergistic forms and their mirror forms. Their mirror forms are shown in small script in black and brackets. But there are three missing. 
out of these 15 valid syllogisms of classical logic. Can we derive them? Yes, we can. We can derive dimities from Darin by switching around the A and the I propositions. We can derive Severin from Calamus, doing the same thing. And we can derive, derive Fressisson from Ferio. This is Ferio. We switch the terms in both the E and the I propositions, and we get the IO form. This shows that all 15 uncontroversially valid classical logical syllogisms can be derived from the uh, prototype of Barbara, which is in line with the spirit, if not the letter, of Spencer Brown's claim. It's hard to see how the remaining nine controversially valid syllogisms of classical logic, which have a change of mood in the conclusion, can be generated from it. Mingus revised notation makes the notation and validation of syllogistic logic as easy as A, B, C. Provided that the notation is used with an understanding of the rules of classical perennial logic and with an appreciation of the initials and consequences of the calculus of indications in rules of form. Here's how it works. Let me give you a demonstration. Briefly, we can put pairs of propositions together and derive conclusions from them. There are four types of propositions. 4 times 4 is 16, but we don't have to use all of them. We can eliminate some. Two negatives can't go together. We can eliminate four proper, um, pairs. Two particulars can't go together. We can eliminate another three. We've already eliminated the O, o pair. And we can also eliminate the EI pair, because that leads to a negative conclusion. If you've got a negative conclusion, you cannot have a major proposition that isn't universal. So that goes. That leaves eight potential pairs that we can render in four figures. If we have pairs of propositions which have an A proposition in them, the conclusion will match the mood of the second proposition. That rule stands for seven of the pairs. There's one other pair, the EI pair, and all you have to remember about that is old MacDonald's farm. It's EI, EIO. I'm sorry, I teach logic, I teach logic to nine year olds using this system. So I've invented these uh, things that make it, make it a bit more memorable. Now, when it comes to the nine controversially valid forms, they are only relevant to pairs of universal premises. So AA and AE, we've already eliminated the EE ones. We change the conclusions from universal to particular to avoid a potential fallacy. So A changes to I, E changes to O. Nine, the nine valid forms arise from different figures. How does this work? What I'm proposing is to maintain a strict distinction between negation and distribution. We use marks for distribution and tildes for negation. And we treat variables, whether they are terms or their contraries, both as marked states. If you're pointing to it, it's marked. Notation becomes easy. In an A proposition, the subject term is distributed. And when I mean distributed, we're talking about all of it. We're packing everything into a container, whether that's round or square, it doesn't matter. But we're talking about all of it. It's distributed through that space. If something is not distributed, we can't pack all of it into a container. Some of it spill, spills out. We haven't got a view of the outside. So when we're talking about an E proposition, no A is B. We know we're talking about all of A, and we know we're talking about all of E, and none of the twain shall meet. Some A is B, neither of the terms are distributed, and some A is not B, we know we're talking about all B, but we are not talking about all A, A is not distributed. Using this notation gives you an immediate, visual, intuitive uh, link to what is happening in our thought when we express our thought using these four patterns. It also makes it very easy to tell whether a syllogism is going to turn out to be valid or not. 
If two middle terms are undistributed or both distributed, we know it's not going to be valid. If two uh, are particular or you have two negative premises, we know it's not going to be valid. If two positive premises lead to a negative conclusion, or vice versa, we know it's not going to be valid. And if you have two particular premises that lead to a universal conclusion, that's not going to be valid either. And it's easy to see these. I'm going to give you an example of how we can see that it works using the AAA family, taking it through four figures. So, all A is B, all B is C, so all A is C. We know that's Barbara, we know it's valid. And we can see that the B term is undistributed and distributed. That's a tautology, we can take them away and just move the remaining terms to the conclusion. And this is why I use the propositions in this order, because it's more intuitive. It's the order that the terms come in in the conclusion. A2, we don't even need to write down the conclusion because we can see immediately that the B terms are not distributed, which renders the syllogism invalid. Same with the AAA3, the two A terms are both distributed, not going to be valid. AAO4 is, some, is a one that looks like it's going to work out because you've got the A terms distributed and undistributed, that's tautology taken away. The conclusion would be some B is not C, but that is a negative proposition resulting from two positive, um, a negative conclusion resulting from two positive propositions, so it's not going to work. That's why you have to know the rules. If you do, or sorry, if you do but want to double check or if you don't know the rules, there is a way of validating. It becomes easy if we use J1, which is equivalent to the blank space, and three of the consequences, C1, C2, C3. Now, if we why does J1 work? Because we're treating both variables as marks. If we substitute the mark for each of these P's, then that leads to a mark over mark for the first, that can be eliminated, that reduces to a mark over mark, that can be eliminated, the whole expression reduces to the blank space. So suppose you have a syllogism and you want to work out whether it's valid or not. You transcribe it, you cross the major and minor premises, and we're going to work with the four AAA figures. If we just use J1 and cross out the forms, that's not going to work because it leaves us with four conclusions that are equally valid and we know that the last three are not valid. So what do we do? What I'm proposing is that we use a series of uh, moves. We assume C1 to have been done. Remember in Spencer Brown's notation of the syllogism, there was a mark of negation over the two things for the and, and another mark of implication. We take those out and we're just left with marks over the two premises. Then you perform C2, that's taking away any variable that matches its form on the outside C1, take away mark over mark, C2 again, J1, take off anything that looks like that, and C3 means we can ignore anything outside an empty mark. If the syllogism reduces to an empty mark, it's valid. For the nine controversially valid forms, you just need to use C2, and you take mark over mark to stand for valid. So, let's look at the 15 uncontroversially valid forms first. AA1 is an example. So, we've crossed the major and minor premises. We apply C2. Can we take A with a cross over it? Off? Yes, we can. Can we take C out? Yes, we can. What does that leave us with? That leaves us with the possibility to take out the mark over mark. That then reduces to 
an expression where we can take the B out from inside the mark. That leaves us an empty cross. We can ignore anything else outside it, and we know that this syllogism is valid. Great. That's what we want. Now, does AAA2 by the same system turn out to be invalid? Let's see. Can we take A with a cross out of it out? Yes. Can we take C out? No, because the C has a cross over it. So we'll just take the A with a cross out of it out, over it out. We can't take a mark over mark out. We can't do C2 again. Can we take J1 out? Yes, we can. That leaves us with an expression which doesn't have an empty mark. So it's going to be invalid. Great, that's what we want. What about AAA3? Well, we can take the C out. Can't take anything else out. That leaves us with a mark over mark. This looks like, mm, don't know. Can we take J1 out? Yes, we can. Does this leave us with an empty mark? No, it doesn't. Great, that is what we want. Now let's see whether it works with the fourth one, which was the problematic one, potentially. Can we take B with a mark out of it? No. Can we take C out? No. Hmm. That means we can't remove any mark over mark. C2 won't work again. Can we take J1 out? Yes. That leaves us with just the conclusion. Does that leave us with anything with an empty mark? No. Great. It is invalid. This works. And I'll leave it to you to work out how it works with all the other 32 minus 4. As for the nine controversially valid forms, well, we only have to work with C2. That means taking out anything inside the mark that is also on the outside. Reminding you of the notation, let's look at AAI family of uh, syllogisms in all four figures. Now, we've crossed the two premises. Three of these figures are valid, one isn't. What's it like to uh, validate them using C2? Can we take A out? No. Can we take C out? Yes. Does that leave us with an empty mark? Yes, it does. Great. It's valid. This is the one we want to find out a result of invalid. Can we take A out? No. Can we take C out? No. Does that leave us with a mark over mark? No. It's invalid. Great. This one, we can take the B and the C out. That leaves us with not just one mark over mark highlighted, but two. Valid. It's working, people. It's good. <laughs> can we take B out? Yes, we can. Does that leave us with mark over mark? It does. And it's really interesting to see the patterns here. You've got single on the left, double, and single on the right. Right, we're giving them in the wrong order. But you can see there's a pattern here. It's really interesting. The notation also helps with inference. Now, the laws of inference say that if you've got an A or an E proposition, those are the two universal propositions, and you know that they are true, you can derive the truth value of the other forms from that. Now, the notation makes this very easy. If you've got a universal proposition, look at the predicate term, in this case the B. If the B is not marked, then anything with the predicate term in the same state is also going to have the same truth value. If it's in the opposite state, it's going to have the opposite truth value. This works when you know that the A and the E propositions are true. What happens if you know that the I proposition is true or false? Well, here you need to look at both terms. In an I proposition, both terms are uncrossed. If both terms are crossed, then you've got the opposite truth value. If an E proposition is false, you can't derive the truth value of the A and the O forms. If an I proposition is false, then you can derive the fact that an E proposition is true. Now, when you know that an E proposition is true, you can use the predicate term and match 
the value of any other proposition which has a predicate term is crossed, and that's true, not crossed, false. Same with the O proposition. Look at both terms, their opposites will be false. If you've got an A, term, a proposition that has a true value, then the, anything that matches the predicate term will have the same value, anything that doesn't will not. When it comes to a version, again, the notation makes it really easy. Here, we have to do a mind flip and remember that the negation can be the equivalent of the mark. And mark over mark means that you can take something off. So, a B is equivalent to a B with a mark over mark over it. And that is equivalent to a uh, distributed not B. A not B is equivalent to a tilde B. But it's much easier to see whether a B is distributed or negated if you use tilde and uh, marks for those two distinct operations. And that's the same difference. Conversion becomes easy as well. Here, you have to look at the predicate term, the B term. If that is unmarked, then the A term crosses over in the same state as the predicate term. If the B term is marked, then the A term crosses over as marked. If you've got an I proposition, the B term will be unmarked, the A crosses over as unmarked, and O propositions don't uh, convert. You just have to remember that. So, in conclusion, I've demonstrated that, yes, we can use the notation if we use Linger's revised forms, and that makes it really easy to see what's going on as we work with classical logic. There are advantages in terms of notation, validation, conversion, obversion, and eduction is just a process of alternating between conversion and obversion. But we're still left with this question of these forms that appear to be valid, but are not valid in classical logic. What do we do with these? I have enough respect for Spencer Brown's work to warrant giving this problem some time to look at, and this is where I'm asking you for your thoughts. If we take the AA04 syllogism, and we use uh, a, B, C as Socrates, human being, and animal. I'm deliberately not going to mortal here because I want to do a genus species tree, like a tree of porphyry. And we say that Socrates is human, humans are animals. We can eliminate the middle terms. One is crossed, one is not crossed. And we derive the conclusion, some animals are not Socrates. Now, I'm sure we wouldn't argue the conclusion, but the question is, can we derive that conclusion from the premises? Spencer Brown is saying we can. That's valid. It's not valid in classical logic because you can't derive a negative conclusion from two positive premises. Now, what happens if we take, rather than the genus-species relationship, an attribute? Does it change anything? Socrates is human, human is mortal. Some mortals are not Socrates. But we're not talking about some mortals. We're talking about humans. All things that are humans are things that are mortal. Some things that are mortal are not Socrates. Or is it some, some of what is mortal is not Socrates? And this is where I suddenly, when I thought of this, I, it was like looking at a necker cube or one of those duck drawings. You have to do a mind flip. What happens... Uh, let me go back a bit. If we do look at this thing of some of what is mortal is not Socrates, what does that mean? Then some of Socrates must be immortal. <clears throat> And that made me look at what the notation was doing to my mindset. And it made me go back 
and look at what Leibniz says. Now, Leibniz was the guy who came up initially with this idea of the uh, mark, the single mark, which would produce a calculus. And he said that every individual substance involves the whole universe in its perfect concept. And all that exists in the universe has existed and or will exist. There is something in corporeal substances analogous to the soul, which is commonly called form. And what does Spencer Brown write? It was a form. Going back to Aristotle, Aristotle wrote, it is a distinctive mark of substance that while remaining numerically one and the same, now please, this rule of mathematicians and physicians, tell me what one and the same means. It is capable of admitting contrary qualities. The modification taking place through a change in the substance itself. Now, if that is not a description of the first distinction, I don't know what is. Going back even further to Parmenides, Parmenides writes, what exists for thinking is the same as the cause of thought. For you won't find thinking without the being in which it has been uttered. For there is nothing else, and will be nothing else, apart from being. For those of you who are familiar with the rules of form, this will sound very familiar. Because fate has bound it to be whole, unmoving, its name shall be everything. Let's go back to this AA of four and apply the convention of intention to our new notation which is one line of variables and a single line of marks. We're only using the second um, line of marks for validation level. So let's just see what happens. If we notate the things like this and don't nest circles, it gives a different relationship visually. By C2, we can get Socrates, mortal, human in one circle. We can get human, mortal, in one circle. We've got human and human as marked and unmarked. Those can be um, eliminated. And we've got Socrates is mortal. But if we look at Socrates as being a mixture of metaphysical substance and physical body, then it doesn't feel right to put Socrates just in the uh, distributed state. What if we don't distribute Socrates? This is one permutation. So, I've got no humans are mortal. I could, no humans are completely mortal is close to the truth. Some of what, well, okay, arguable. You could argue that that's an O proposition, fair enough. Some of what is Socrates is human. Some of what is Socrates is immortal. But that is a valid solution, it's an EIO too. So what is the notation doing? I'm left in the dark. But maybe that's a good place to be. Taking us back to the time when Leibniz was writing, in England, Lord Herbert of Cherbury wrote a sonnet of black beauty. Black beauty, which above that common light, he wrote, whose power can no colours here renew, but those which darkness can again subdue, Dost still remain unvaried to the sight, and, like an object equal to the view, and neither changed with day nor hid with night, when all these colours which the world call bright, and which old poetry doth so pursue, are with the night so perished and gone, that of their being there remains no mark. Thou still abidest so entirely one, that we may know thy blackness is a spark of light inaccessible, and alone our darkness, which can make us 
think it done. Hopefully your comments will take me out of the dark into that light and accessible. Any of those ones in no, brackets? No, I, I need it in words because I'm not the symbolism of words. You want one with an I from you know, I need something in the form of all A or B, some B or C, that kind okay. of thing. Maybe this also we have all, to do afterwards. Uh, some A or B. Some A or B, okay. All A is C. All A or C. 
and you can derive the conclusion and, and, and some A or I'm just writing in English. Okay. Some A or B or A or C. So you've got and you want me to conclude that some B or C. Some B or C. And, and the assertion is that that one doesn't seem to be on the list. That's um, not on the list. On of the Spencer Brown list. It, it is on the Spencer Brown list. So I want to it wasn't on the Spencer Brown list of invalids that is either marked to be invalid. I wanted one that goes because outside of Spencer Brown's system. So you say, you say there are valid syllogisms that are not marked out as valid by Spencer Brown's uh, wheel. I don't think I say that. I, Spencer Brown claims that there are 24 valid forms derivable from his prototype Barbara. Which there are. Which there are. And we both agree, um, you know, you can verify his Venn diagram or what you want. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm saying that not all of those 24 match the 24 recognized syllogisms of classical logic for 15 uncontroversially valid and the nine not controversially valid. Well that, that's fine. Then, then I would like to have one that's not uh, that's not <laughs> you're exactly what you just said. Okay. Okay. Somebody who is recognized as, as a syllogism in classical logic that doesn't seem to be on the 24. A syllogism that is You said that not all the 24 are part of the classical uh, litany, right? The classical no. litany is outside of the 20. There are some things on the classical litany of valid syllogisms yes. that are outside of Spencer Brown's yes. 24. Okay. And so I asked you for an example, so I could play with it. Okay, yes. so any of the nine um, controversially valid ones cannot be derived from uh, his is this one of those? So or this? No. So oh. AAI, for instance. Oh, so give me, give me one of the nine and then we'll be done with this. <laughs> okay. Um, so an AAI uh, would be all A is B, all B is C. All A are B. All B, B is C. All B are C. So some A is C. Some A. Well, see, and that's supposed to be valid classically. That's one of the nine controversial. What does controversial mean? Sorry. Not everybody agrees that it's valid. Sorry, that Not be... everybody agrees that it's valid. Oh, that probably that doesn't because because depend on the sum. Oh, well, that's exactly because of the sum, I'm sure. That it, it'll be valid if you believe that sum X or Y could be, could be satisfied. So, um, Sister Miriam Joseph uh, uh, explains that we can never be sure that we're talking about everything in a conclusion. So we modify the universal to a particular to avoid potential fallacy. Well, right. But, but we can check that the controversial ones involve some X or Y, and, and, and this could be empty. Yeah. yeah. OK. No, just the remark about this. Uh, uh, shouldn't you take into account also the figure, not just the AAI? Because. Uh, yeah, we do take it into account. Okay, no, but uh, the, my point, uh, the question was, uh, some people would question that uh, uh, the use of Socrates in uh, uh, considering, uh, 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 considering it a proper syllogism, because A, uh, E, O, I is a classification of general proposition, either universal or particular. Socrates is an individual term. So You're talking about all of Socrates. Uh, yes, but uh, that you can do that only on the assumption that you mentioned that you consider Socrates the way Leibniz considers it as a set of, of all its properties. Not if you take Socrates as just that uh, single thing which can be, it's like uh, going from extension to intention, or, uh, uh, so some of the problems may may depend on on on, uh, on this. So only in, on the assumption that you take the perfect notion of Socrates. Uh, the other day I was mentioning the fact that uh, the perfect notion of Adam 
Adam uh, contains the whole uh, history of mankind. But that's a set of properties. It's not one single individual. So uh, some people would object that using Socrates, like for instance when Stuart Mill uses uh, all men are mortal, the Duke of Wellington is a man, so even he is mortal, he, uh, it's not a proper uh, syllogism, it's uh, uh, using uh, an individual term. Well, but it was just a remark. Yeah, but then we're changing levels of extension and intention. So either we take the term in its maximum Well, that, 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 that brings in uh, uh, questions about uh, nominalism or... Uh, really? Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry. It's okay. There is a, a call. I'm sorry. Another question? Yeah, uh, just a last comment. It's strange to think about this business about the sum. Well, yeah, everybody in modern logic course, came down on finally, all right, uh, exists and some are, are different. Uh, I mean, exists and for all are different across the fact that some A or B will mean there really are A's. Mm -hmm. But when you're thinking in terms of laws of form, it's ever kind of evanescent. Like, I know. what do I mean by existence? And things are a little bit flickering, and you're in a different space. So you could well want to do what you do and find a way to in, ameliorate the entire class of logic. Really beautiful questions. Yes, thank and, you. And Spencer Brown was talking about the same thing, but he was holding yeah. really quite strongly to the sum A or B means there is an A, yeah. uh, as do everyone else who does standard logic. So he was talking about the universal in the particular, but he didn't get to this kind of an essence point. Yeah, and that's what I'm interested in yes. exploring. Yes. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for inviting us. Nikki would like us to line up quickly for a photo and get that taken outside. Well, I would, but first of all, can we check about supper? Because if we're doing takeaways, then we should phone up, you know, like now, before we go out. And then, because if we're hoping that something's going to be delivered, then that's what we need.